They say one of the most wonderful things in life is to wake up and enjoy a cuddle with somebody. Unless you're in prison. Hey there, Snafu Al here. I'm going to record this in uh, on my camera with my phone with the reverse thing on there. So uh, anyway, um, I got a question from uh, Suzette. Um, I think she she lives. I think she's living in a van in Quebec. Canada, and um, she had some questions. Um, I'll just read it here. It's up on the screen behind me there. I was wondering if you would consider putting something on your channel for Canadians wanting to do van living and going into the States for the winter months. Things such as laws, insurance, health care, border issues, etc. Um, maybe have some really concrete info about places to go. Or there may be other Canadians. I'm a little confused as your idea of nomad living and the desire to feel homeless and singing. <laughs> it would be wonderful if you explain more background for your followers. Okay, well, Canadians wanting to do van living. I guess I'll just quickly, about five years ago, I decided I'm an RV and I got a little class C RV um, but um, the first year I, I went out east to Newfoundland and back yeah, twice actually my my um, guitar and he had his hometown is in northern uh, Newfoundland Fleur de Lis so I went there um, all the boys hopped in my RV and we all went out and we played for a couple weeks and we played and we went cod fishing and you know we made good money um playing there because they pay very well um and then um that was in, in july we came back i went um back myself in september for a short visit and then when i came back um i i based in my sister's driveway until um I guess it was November might have been December even I can't remember exactly but anyway I had my drums in my RV and I decided to go to Florida um I just decided to go down there for the winter it didn't turn out right I got stopped at the border and um I was vague about you know when I was coming back, basically, I said, oh, I'm going down to Florida. I know people in Largo and Fort Lauderdale. And and when the border agent asked me, when, the, when am I coming back? I said, well, I'm just going to stay down there as long as I can as a Canadian. So, you know, um, six months I'm allowed, I'll probably do that, you know. Um, where are you going to stay? How are you going to make money? Blah, 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 right? My answers were vague I said well I I have my I have my CPP and um, uh, some savings and I'll, I'll live off of that if I can't afford it I'll come home you know but that wasn't good enough why do you have the drums you're going down there to play so they figured I was going to um, make money down there playing my drums and singing and whatever um, they went online and they saw uh, advertisements online about my band that, uh, you know, um, we used to play pretty regular and I had on there, you know, for bookings, call Al or email me or whatever. So it appeared that I was a working musician. I told them, no, I'm just going on vacation. But um, I, I, all in all, I was just maybe too vague. And so the fellow decided that I was going down to make money, which is, you know, not allowed. You're not allowed to, you know, make any kind of money. You know, you're not allowed to, you're not allowed to get up and jam at an open mic if there's any kind of uh, reward for it. Like, um, you know, 
you can't fill in for a drummer, you know, for the evening and get paid. Um, even though it's cash, nobody knows about it. You're still not allowed to do it. Even if somebody says, um, um, I will play for beer, you know. So I didn't know very much about all that. So I got banned for a year. I could have got banned for five years, actually, lad, but uh, the guy that supervisor said just banned him for a year. So because of that, I had to go back home to Ontario and Brighton. And then um, now winter's coming. I'm living in an RV. I don't want to deal with cold weather anymore. So I went online and... Um, just happened I got a request uh, by email from a fellow out in Victoria, B.C. He needed a drummer for the for the New Year's Eve gig coming up. Could I be there by December 9th? And um, so, you know, do a little rehearsing or whatever for the gig before the 31st. So I said, yeah, I'm going to do it. So I replied yes, and I took off for um, British Columbia. I went online and discovered that, you know, Victoria was the warmest city in Canada. I couldn't go south unless I flew over, you know, flew um, to somewhere, Mexico or, you know, an island somewhere. Um, so I went to um, Victoria. It took me a week or so. Lucky... I never saw a snowflake. Uh, well, North Bay, it, it started to storm snow. Uh, and I left North Bay and I was in a blizzard, but it cleared up, you know, within, before the end of the day, I was out of it and uh, went all the way across Canada and never saw a snowflake, even in through the mountains. There was snow around, but I, I, I was lucky. I never ran into any snowstorms or whatever. I arrived in Victoria. It was, you know, raining. <laughs> and um, I, it was raining a lot. But I discovered that, hey, it never gets really cold here. So this it's true. It is warm in, the, um, in comparison to the rest of Canada. It is warm in the winter. In fact, I rode my motorcycle all winter. Because I had it on the back. I had a 650 Suzuki. I had it on the back of my RV. So to get around, um, I uh, would camp on a, on the beach. And um, and I wouldn't go anywhere. I'd go on my motorcycle. Then I ended up getting, after the, the New Year's Eve gig, I... Uh, waitress in uh, one of the bars I was playing and she her mother-in-law had a horse ranch a small horse ranch and I was offered to camp there beside the barn or the stable and um, I could hook up electricity they had well water they had a hose so I was able to hook up to their water supply as well so I was there for few months anyway and then I found another spot um, circumstances happened uh, on the, um, a new owner come in to the, uh, the property and didn't want anybody helping out so I have stories on online about maybe I do anyway about uh, things that happened while I was on the on the ranch it was fun we were allowed to use the uh, I was allowed to use the tack room for rehearsing with the boys that I was playing with and that and we I had a really good time while I was there. In fact, when summer came, it was so beautiful. I wanted to um, see what it was like, and I stayed. So I was two and a half years in Victoria. And I never saw snow. It was, um, it was the odd one or two nights during the winter time, two winters. Um, you know, where the, I'd wake up, there was frost on the window. Uh, it might have hit zero or one minus one during the night, but... Basically, the average temperature the whole winter was 9, 10 degrees. It went down sometimes 3 and 2, I'm talking Celsius. Uh, and uh, it went, um, you know, some, some days in the middle of the winter, it was, you know, like very pleasant, 17, 18 degrees Celsius. 
Um, <laughs> so for the whole winter, it was beautiful. I ended up doing two winters there. Second winter was a lot of rain, a lot of rain, a lot, a lot of rain. Um, the rain is better than snow, I say, but it got uh, a little depressing. I miss my kids, too. So anyways, uh, the, 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 the second the second summer came around, and I, maybe the third summer was on its way. I can't remember. I was there two and a half years. But I remember I came back in July. Um, I drove back here. It's very expensive in an RV to drive across Canada, by the way. Um, and then um, I had to, I had to work out. Uh, since Homeland Security has taken over and uh, since 9/11 and Homeland Security and now Trump, you got to be real careful when you cross the border. Number one, you got to have an agenda. You got to tell them where you're going, when you're coming back. How are you supporting yourself? They've got to believe that you can do it. They don't want you down there ending up on their welfare system. So these things are important. You really got to tell the truth. You have no criminal record. You have no criminal record. You had one but got it pardoned. Watch how you answer those questions because if you say you had no criminal record, you're not lying. They asked me, have you ever been convicted of a, of a criminal offense and had a pardon? I was red flagged, so maybe they decided to check deeper into me, like FBI files or whatever. But anyway, when he looked me right in the eye and asked me that question, I went, he might know. And I did. When I was 17, I had a minor, minor offense now, but... In 1970, it wasn't, it was a, what we call an indictable offense. In 86, they switched it to a, a non-indictable offense. Um, um, and then, in 1975, I had a pardon. So, for 45 years, I was going back and forth across the border. And, you, know, you have a criminal record or anything? Nope. You know, no problem, eh? Of course, those days you could just show your driver's license or birth certificate and you could go. But um, you now it's the passports and Homeland Security and they just check you up. If you ever were convicted of what they call a felony, what we call an indictable offense, um, whether it's pardoned or not, they don't recognize our pardon. So whether it was pardoned or not, they can say, eh, eh. We don't allow anybody over with a criminal record, a felony record. Um, mine was questionable because it was a, a misdemeanor to them, a um, non indictable offense after 86. And it took a while, but the fellow, he found the Martin's criminal code for 1970 and the one for 1986. And he said, you know, when you did this little thing, you, it was a, felony. He's talking American now. It was a felony. In 1986, they reduced it to a misdemeanor. Uh, or a misdemeanor, yeah. Um, or non-indictable. Non or either or. You know, depending on circumstances, the judge could say mm, it's a felony or um, indictable, you know. So, he said, I'd like to let you go, you know, because it was a minor offense today, but Back in the 70s when you did it, it wasn't so minor. And I have to go by the rules of 1970. So I can't let you over. So he said, uh, you know, you need to apply for a waiver. So I got the application. I paid $565. I applied for the waiver. And, um, you, you know, um, it's going to take three or four months. So... Um, I think this was in uh, July, August, August or September. I was just going over the test to make sure that, you know, my one year suspension was, you know, definitely off and um, never made it. Um, so for that winter, I just um, booked a flight to Jamaica and I went to Jamaica. I spent the whole winter in Jamaica. The waiver did come. I was 
waived. I got my waiver. It came in the mail. My sister mailed it to me in Jamaica. And I, I think um, I was in Jamaica from November to February, end of February or something. And I'm, I decided to test the waiver out. And I, instead of, I canceled my return flight back May 1st and changed it to, you know, a couple of days. And I flew to Fort Lauderdale to meet my sister. I landed in Fort Lauderdale. They saw my waiver letter. Where are you going? What are you doing? I'm going to visit my sister. And uh, she's in a condo resort. And I'm going to stay with her and then go home with her in her car. And everything was fine. So the waiver is good. The next, next year I went south again. Tested the waiver out November 1st. I crossed over. I knew where I was going. I was going, um, I'm going to visit somebody in Nashville. I'm going to visit somebody in Texas. Uh, actually, stay in Texas there for a couple of weeks with some friends that I have a family of friends. And, um, and I'm going to go to Arizona. And I had a. Um, address for Coyote Howells, which is a, um, an RV camp near um, Yuma, Arizona. And I said, well, that's where I'm probably going to, you know, end up staying there. And I, from the time I get there, a month from now, until I decide to come home. I had, I was 65, so I had my my pension, so I have all my government pensions, so I had enough money to survive um, in the States and come back. Um, and so they, they sometimes ask you to prove you have money in the bank or, you know, prove your income. Um, they might ask you about health care, perhaps if you get sick or whatever, what coverage have you got? might ask you that maybe they never asked me that but apparently they do if you if you lie to them about anything they're not letting you over so that's that's about all i can say about the border um don't think just because you um, um have a pardon that you're going to get over um it depends same as you have a criminal record, if it's a minor offense, like if it's a drinking and driving charge that you had five years ago or 20 years ago, it doesn't matter when. If it's just one and it's been a reasonable length of time, you haven't had any trouble, they'll probably let you over. It's up to them. But they, I, you know, the guard told me that it was okay because I inquired about that. I don't have one, but a member of my family does. So, he said, yeah, he'll... We'll probably let them over if it's just one time. Anything, um, theft, violence, firearms, drugs, doesn't matter if you're pardoned or not. They're not going to let you over. It's it's a felony in their eyes. You're a felon and you can't come. So don't go spending all that money to get a pardon just so you can go to the States. Or maybe any other country, I don't know. Get it because it helps you here in Canada getting a job, insurance, or whatever, you know, whatever reason, um, criminal record can hinder you here in Canada, don't do it because you want to go to the States, because it may not, may not be worth papers written on to them. Uh, uh, laws, insurance, health care, um, Depending on your age, I think you can have complete coverage when you're traveling in the States um, with the Canadian uh, insurance company, Green Shield, um, Blue Shield, Blue Cross, whatever they call it, all these different add-on plans. OHIP won't cover you now. Apparently, it would cover you. It was questionable before. You know, you're allowed two weeks uh, under OHIP. And most insurance will cover you for a two-week vacation anywhere. But if you're up longer than that, you have to have specific coverage. I 
think my last quote was um, because of my age, because I smoke. Um, I think it was seven hundred and twenty dollars for four months. I think it would have been five hundred and twenty or five forty or something like that if I was a non-smoker. So let's say, I don't know, if you're a normal person of good, of uh, you know, average health or whatever, you know, hundred and say hundred and fifty a month, just to round it off for health insurance until you're a certain age. I think uh, I just heard you seventy-five or over. I think once you hit seventy-five, that everything doubles. You know. Because you're not going to be around for long, I guess they figure. <laughs> anyway, um, the singing and the drumming, and um, that's just something I did every weekend for 30 years. I had a band, I drum and I sing, and uh, we used to play every weekend. So um, um, I have recordings, I play them in the background. Um, on my videos, I, you know, pieces of recording of songs or maybe a whole song if I'm doing a long drive or something. Um, I don't use any other background music um, that YouTube supplies or, or whatever. I just use my own. I don't have enough subscribers. I don't make any money off YouTube, so I don't worry about it anyway. Besides, if I make money, Chances are I'm going to lose part of my pension. Um, part of my pension is uh, a supplement because we're, we have to make a certain amount a year. If, if a pension don't amount to that much, the government gives you a subsidy, um, guaranteed income supplement, I think they call it, so that it brings you up to a, an income level, 17000 18000 um, If you work... If you earn money doing anything, um, you gotta tell them. And I think it says, I think I read somewhere they'll take um, for every three dollars. For every three dollars you make, they take a buck off. Or every two dollars you make, they take a dollar off. So then your subsidy goes. Tsh. So whatever you're doing, you're really doing it for half the money you you're claiming you're making, basically. So um, I really. Don't care if I make money doing this at all. Um, I, tr you know, I ask for donations or please, you know, buy my T-shirts that I put on Teespring or whatever. Um, you know, if I make a little bit of money, I put that aside and that's what I use to feed homeless people. I use my own money anyway, but I can just buy more or, or help out more homeless people if I have this fund. So, uh, you know, out of my $1,800 a month pension I get, um, you know, I, I might spend 100 a month you know, buying a $10 meal for somebody. Um, what I'm going to, what I try and do is um, I, I make up a little bag, you know, an apple and a peach and a banana, you know, um, a can of sardines. Um, a can of uh, soup that with the open, you know, that you can just uh, eat out of the can if you have to. You know, something like that. I make up a little meal. Um, sometimes I'll, if, uh, if a homeless person is um, up to it, or game, or whatever you want to say, I'll take them into a Walmart and let them buy something for themselves. You know, we've got prepared foods there. Or... Maybe I'll walk them into a McDonald's and buy them a meal. You know, whatever, whatever way I can do it, mm, roughly ten bucks. And I've been known just to give a ten dollar bill to to uh, homeless person because circumstances were just you know didn't have and have something prepared in my RV or now I'm in a van, so I might not have something handy. So I'll do that. Um, so, traveling with me, I record things that have interest um, and feeding homeless people. Well, if I can, I, I record feeding homeless people. And they're very shy and don't want to be recorded sometimes. I'm thinking of a little spy camera. I had one and I lost it, but it's a pen, you know, and it's a, I could put it in my pocket and 
they won't know I'm recording them and you know what they don't know won't hurt them but I haven't done that yet that's I, I think I should do that I can actually record you know uh, interchanges with the homeless people because some of them are they're not homeless you know that's how they make their money they panhandle so I'm very I'm always I got to make sure that they are just homeless people and need help you know I, I see a real disability I know they can't work and they're not if they're on the street asking for money chances are I'll drive by but if I see a homeless person sitting somewhere and he's got a shopping cart full of stuff and, and he's just sitting you know um, obviously homeless um, maybe I, uh, I see a guy with a little pup tent and he's living under a bridge something like that when I really know the guy's homeless and um, struggling and not just you know making a couple hundred dollars a day standing on a corner with a sign you know, thank you very much, you know. Um, these people are obviously just, you know, entrepreneurs. So it's hard to, sometimes it's hard to separate the entrepreneurs from the homeless people. Uh, I try, uh, I can't, I can't pass somebody like that, that is really homeless and down and out without offering some help. Food, mostly food. Uh, maybe I... I, sometimes when I'm in those um, thrift shops and that, you know, I'll buy a, a hoodie or, you know, a, a warm jacket, you know, socks or something, you know, that whatever I, if I have a little room that I can keep, I'll, I think, you, you want some mittens? You want some, uh, you want a hoodie? How about a blanket? You know, anything like that, I might even go get it for you, right? If I don't like to say, yeah, I, I need, I would love a blanket or I would sure love to replace these shoes on a size 10, I'll say, well, you know, don't go anywhere. <laughs> Probably not anyway. Um, I'll be back, you know, and I'll actually go out and find a, a thrift shop or something and maybe find a pair of shoes. Whatever. I just do what I can. Um, but, you know, it's not a, you know, it's not a, it's not like a, um, you know, Come along with me and watch me feed homeless people kind of sight. Um, I may go days, weeks, I may never even see a homeless person because I'm out in the boonies, you know. Um, so it's not a number, you know, it's not my purpose of being on the, on the road, per se. I just, you know. I keep my eye open and I try and help whenever I can and with limited funds so I do what I can winter time in Canada I wouldn't even want to try it you've got heat that's your number one concern how am I gonna stay warm in this godforsaken land barren to me it's like you know Living in the, even if I'm just around the city, even in Toronto, and that it's, you know, if it's winter time, I might as well be up in uh, Alaska, North Pole, Yukon, because it's cold. I don't like the cold, so I don't recommend uh, living in a van in the winter time if you're not going to go south, or at least go to Victoria area where it's not so cold. You know, because some people can't cross the border they, for various reasons, and uh, they won't allow them in. And they don't have the money to go somewhere where we're allowed in, like Jamaica, part of the Commonwealth. Like if you're Canadian, you're pretty much guaranteed six months at least. Anyway, uh, so I don't recommend it. But if you happen to, the main concern. I would say would be heat. So if you're in a in an RV a van, um, the only the only source of heat you're going to have is a, well if you have an electric heater and you have somewhere where you can plug it in, I guess you're okay. But you've got to get a propane heat. And if you 
you have your van insulated properly, you know, with uh, Reflectix and, and, or any kind of the brick, if you really spend the time and effort and insulate your van really well, and you have your little um, air vents going, um, because if you're using propane heat, you're going to get uh, moisture. So you have to have a, a vent system so you don't, you know, you're, you're warm, but it's raining inside your vent, you know. Um, so I just, you know, I don't know a lot about it because I never went to that extreme. I get the hell out and I go where it's warmer. Oh, um, places to go in, in the States for um, where you can meet other Canadians. Um, uh, anywhere in the South. You're going to run into in Florida. They're probably the majority of the population are Canadian, um, older Canadians, of course. Um, snowbirds. Um, that's what I am. I consider myself a snowbird. Florida's hard to uh, unless you've got money and you can pay for these camping sites, and they're booked up always. Um, if you're in a van and you're a st good stealth camper, or you can find places where. Um, out in the boonies where, you know, watch out for rattlesnakes and um, uh, alligators. <laughs> Florida is probably the warmest part of, of the states, and uh, but it's the hardest to um, boondock in. Um, you know, so, and they're, they're always looking for people sleeping overnight, and they'll wake you up in the middle of the night, so you got to be a really good stealth camper. Um, uh, for the states, and if you're in a, an RV, you know, you can't really stealth camp, you're just going to be a, you know, hey, the only thing to do is sleep during the day, find a nice spot during the day in the park or whatever, by the water, and make sure you get your sleep in during the day, and then just stay up all night, drive around, um, from coffee shop to coffee shop or whatever, you know, just don't be sleeping in your RV at night. Um, in a van, you might get away with it if uh, nobody knows you're in the van. Right? So, stealth camping. Um, on the other side of the south, so like around the Gulf, Mississippi, uh, Kentucky, um, Kentucky, Mississippi, uh, Alabama, uh, Louisiana, you get pretty, um, the weather's not as nice. Um, uh, in the winter time, but um, they're pretty, they're pretty um, welcoming to um, to nomads. I'll say nomad. Texas, they love you. Um, Texas, there's lots of free camping, lots of places where you can stay. I stayed four months on South Padre Island in Texas, right on the Gulf, on an island. Um, it was. Lots of free camping um, on this particular beach in, in South, South Padre. I could stay there 24-7. Um, in my RV, I drove it on the beach. And I had a little $25 sticker. $25 a month. Allowed me to come and go off the beach. Stay on the beach. Didn't matter. It's well patrolled by border security and, um, and the park rangers. Very well patrolled. Very safe. Um... And that $25 also allowed me to go to the, uh, I can't even remember the name of it, that was the, the RV park where I bought this sticker. You could go to the RV park and uh, have sh hot showers and uh, you know, fill up my water tanks and whatever. Use the facilities. I just didn't have a site. I couldn't stay overnight. Because that was, that was $60 a night. Um, $650 a month, blah, 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 blah can't afford it anyway so uh hmm. but there was lots of free parking so this year i'm going uh going um coming this year coming i'm going to go through texas and and then i'm going from arizona new mexico california i'm going to work my way to uh san diego actually is the my destination eventual destination before i head home so, and then when I head home, I'm going to go up the, uh, the West Coast. 
East Highway all the way to BC because even May in Ontario is shitty. So I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to hit BC at the end of April, May, whenever I get there. Um, May, part of June, I'm going to stay in Victoria. Wait till it gets nice and warm in Ontario and then come back to Ontario. So my six months is actually going to be like seven or seven and a half months uh, that I do my tour. And then I'll be back in Ontario again in June, July, August, September, October. Uh, and from there, I don't know, I might go north, I might continue to go west to the coast, uh, PEI, or, you know, I never know what I'm doing, actually. I just like to travel around. And now that I'm in a, a minivan, oh, 22 miles to the gallon. So it's not as comfortable as, as this RV here. You don't have the, the stove and the fridge and the air conditioning and the, and the furnace. And, and I have a generator. When I'm not, uh, I hook up to a landline. I got 3,500 watt generator. I have all the conveniences of home in this rig. I just can't afford the gas. Seven miles to the gallon. Give me a break. So, and it's old. It's 30 years old. 31 years old now. It's going to cost me a lot. Um, gas. Repairs coming up, you know. So it's basically stationary here in Brighton where I... Um, call it my base camp. If I want to travel, I'm going in the minivan. Like I said, it's not as comfortable, but I got a bed and a table with a stove and water, and and I have a little bit of a power pack, battery pack. I still haven't decided which way I'm going to go. Whether I'm going to go solar or one of those um, Jackeries or similar or something similar. Um, a 500 watt jackery would maybe just all I need, um, or one of those quiet generators, uh, 1800, 2000 watt quiet generator. I think I'm thinking all the time I'm going to find a really good deal. I got my 3500 watt generator for 300 bucks on sale, so I, I know I'm going to find. A really good deal like that for a thousand or two thousand watt generator inverter, the quiet ones, not Honda, of course, but they have competitors that are uh, way cheaper. Oh, I don't know if there's any other questions. Uh, she's that <laughs> that's that's about all I can tell you. I have um, a little uh, drum kit in the suitcase. And that's the only drumming or singing I'm going to do is if I happen to be somewhere where somebody, uh, you know, they've got their guitars and harmonicas out and they're jamming away and I can provide the backbeat because my drums are in a suitcase. The suitcase shell, the suitcase itself is my kick drum. I have a little attachment on the bottom where I can hook up my kick pedal. And inside the drum, or inside the suitcase, I have a snare and a tom and uh, my hi-hat and cymbals. I have one cymbal, crash, or crash ride cymbal. So I'm either riding or riding or crashing. And I got one tom and a snare and the suitcase is my kick. So that's good enough to, um, to jam with people around the campfire and that. I don't do it for money. <laughs> I think that's about it. Do you have any other questions, anybody? Suzette, um, you know how to do it. Comments down below. Um, try and yeah, uh, I'm trying to help uh, answer any questions. I'm I'm the kind of guy that kind of just rolls along with life, and uh, if, a, if, a, if a situation occurs or problem arises, I uh, figure out a way to solve it. So. Um, Maybe you've got a problem I can't solve, but maybe I can think of a, of a solution for you, because I'm kind of like that. Whew. This video is already 20 minutes long. Oh, half an hour, I was going to say half an hour, but then there was it's two parts so far, I think. Oh, well. 
Yep, 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 right? Sorry about that. I'm old. Okay. So the other question was, uh, um, comparing, uh, oh, finding Canadians down in, in the States, uh, when you're snowbirding, um, they're all over the place. Canadians are everywhere down in the South. Um, as I say, uh, I don't know, 60% of, uh, Florida is Canadian. Um, and, uh, when I went around the Gulf, um, as I said, the RVing, uh, or in the RV, uh, even easier in a van. But, as I say, like, you're welcome pretty much in the, the south around the Gulf. Texas, they love us. You know, they want us to be there. Lots of free camping you know, come and spend our money, you know, they like that, you know, so, um, you can't stay somewhere without buying stuff, right, so, I mean, it makes sense, um, I, I didn't get to Arizona, New Mexico, or, um, um California, which I'm going to do this winter, so, um, I'll go through Mexico, you know, like through, um, California, Texas, uh, and this time I'll, I'll continue on. So I got Arizona, New Mexico, and uh, I want to hit California, San Diego. I'm going to put a little map of my route, my planned route for this winter. In any second now, I'll put it up. But um, my understanding is um, there's lots of free camping, and for um, the Southwest is states are you know, very um, welcome welcoming to um, RVers and vanners, campers. <clears throat> so you can find lots of boondocking sites and free camping and what have you. Um, or you can go pay um, lots and lots of nice places. This thousand, thousand trails or something. If you're in an RV, this is a really good deal. Like, you know, 700 bucks for the whole year. Um, but you have to, you know, limited stays and what have you. But, you know, that's another YouTube site. You can check out all that. Almost anything you can find out on YouTube anyways. Um, you want to hook up with um, other Canadians um, in the Southwest, uh, Arizona, Nevada, um, um, New Mexico, <clears throat> you know, uh, all those states, California, even uh Parts of California are, are anti um, RVers and campers, and parts of California are very welcoming. So, Job's gonna. <clears throat> there's lots of um, BML land, BLM land, Bureau of Land Management land in the Southwest. It's all free camping, 14 day limits. You know, so you just gotta move 20 miles or 25 miles every two weeks. Um, all kinds of caravans where um, RVers and, or banners, you know, they get together and they travel together in groups, you know, um, through all this free camping land. Um, Arizona the most, I think. And then, uh, um, you know, because those guys, the Americans anyway, they, uh, the nomads there, they like to um, say they stay in the lowlands, like desert and that during the winter where it's warmer. And then when it gets hot, it's really hot in the summer, but they just, so they just go north or up into the highlands, you know, where it's cooler and they travel back and forth, you know, between those states, um, like say Arizona and Nevada and uh, I, think, I think it's Utah, Oregon, Washington, you know, all these Western states and Southwestern in particular are all very, very, um, uh, free camping sites and, and that there's all kinds of them dispersed camping they call it um, anywhere in the United States they have the national parks the state parks and you pay certain fees or whatever and you get really cheap camping 
Um, um, what a lot of people do is they find these parks. They don't want to pay to get into the park, but what they'll do is they'll they'll Google they'll Google uh, Earth uh, the parks and they'll look for the uh, service roads. Um, avoid the main entrance and paying fees, and they'll use the service roads to find little little places off the service roads. It's a good way for free camping. Um, this all goes the same in Canada. If you live in Canada, you know, except for, you know, going up way or north where it's cold and that in the winter and what have you, I wouldn't even consider it. But um, in Canada in the summertime, uh, all the provinces, they have the provincial parks, so they have the federal parks, and there's also crown land. Crown land is free. And the federal and provincial parks, there's always some kind of fees, but it's reasonable, I think. Um, I just avoid. I, 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 I think uh, I've been to maybe three RV camps in the five years, you know, uh, other than when I was actually staying in Victoria. I, I paid rent on the horse ranch, and I, um, and I. Um, like I paid for my site, like just to be there for hydro and what have you. And the same thing in uh, uh, in Sydney, Sydney, uh, BC. I there was an abandoned uh, gas station, and and uh, there was the spot in the front on the street where the pumps used to be, and then there was like four or five spots in the back, and it was all fenced. And the owners of that property, they would charge something like, uh, geez, I think it was two, two fifty or three hundred a month. Three hundred a month plus fifty dollars for hydro, and you could hook up, and they even had a, a dump thing there if you had you wanted to drain your tanks, but you had hydro, and you could get Wi-Fi from Shaw Cable. You know, you could actually live there all year round in the backyard in your uh, RV. Um, I did that for a couple months, but most, uh, other than that, I was on, uh, um, I think it's called Ocean View Beach. Um, I wasn't, I didn't have my pension yet then, and I was working, uh, a couple of nights a week in the, uh, McDonald's in Sydney. It was a McDonald's, so I went in and I cleaned the grills and, uh, changed the oil and, uh, French fry vats and mop the floor and that. I think I worked three, four hours a night. Um, five nights, four nights a week or something like that. Just for um, just for extra money because I was... So I was working part-time because I wasn't retired. All I had was just my first pension, the CPP, which we get at you know, age 60. It was not much, but it was, yeah, you know, it paid... Paid, paid, paid enough. So then I would, <clears throat> I would work there at night. I think I started at ten or ten or eleven or twelve at night, and I'd work till three in the morning, four in the morning, or whatever. Three in the morning, I think. Three thirty, something like that. And then I would uh, sometimes I just hang out in the parking lot until they came in to do breakfast, and then I grabbed the scrambled eggs, extra breakfast or whatever, because it was included in my shift. And then I go down to uh, Ocean View Beach and just have my breakfast, which was my supper, and uh, loll around on the beach until I fell, you know, fall asleep and sleep most of the day on on the on the beach there, and then do the McDonald's thing again at night. Um, never got bothered. It was free. Anyway, um, you can do that in Canada, in the States, you know, it's, you just got to, you know, there's lots of apps that you can put on your phone for um, finding free parking, camping, um, freecamping.net, and others, oh, there's a couple of them, um, I forget, I forget the name of all of them, you know. Um, for free parking, I I know there's a bunch of apps, and I I have a couple of them on my phones. I have two phones. I have one for down there and one up for up here. 
Um, my phone down there is uh, great. It's Verizon. I may have. I think Verizon is was fine. Um, Verizon for seventy five bucks a month uh, American. I have uh, unlimited data and a hotspot, so I could use my laptop. And then when I'm up here, it's you know fifty bucks a month and a hundred bucks a gig. You know, it's ridiculous. Um, but we all know about the Canadian prices versus American price. If you buy something in, uh, you know, stuff in the States is so much cheaper. Um, if it wasn't for our shitty dollar, it would, it would really be cheaper. You know, you, you buy something here in Canada, it's... 120 bucks down in the states it's 60 bucks but by the time you pay the exchange you know it's 100 bucks whatever it's still well, sometimes it's cheaper still but we really get shafted up here <laughs> yeah the government really likes to shove it to us canadians you know and then they just justify it by saying well, you get free health care you know, bullshit you pay for that too um taxed up the ads to pay for that anyway that's that's another story um so yeah and there's canadians all over the place you know and they're always looking for to, to to meet other canadians just keep an eye out for the license plates there's so many groups online um caravans you know they're the great they're great because you you can these caravan groups you can meet up with other people, Canadians, banners, our beers, whatever you, you know, whatever you're into, and uh, you travel along with them, you know, you go off on your own, or you hook up with them again later, whatever, you know, it's, uh, it's not a big deal, um, I could probably, if we had the weather we have down south, I'd probably be just as happy doing it only in Canada, but I don't like the cold. I hate the cold. So, um, oh yeah, the map of my route for this winter, and I'll, I'll video myself, you know, as much as I can on my travels. Starting out in Virginia, uh, and going Texas, like, uh, I'm going to Nashville, and then Texas, and then this time, instead of last year, I, I was going to Arizona, but I ended up on the Gulf, Galveston and Corpus Christi and and Brownsville and all those coastal um, spots on the Gulf. So I ended up, like I say, I stayed almost the whole winter in Texas, South Texas, and then traveled around the Gulf to Florida. I met up with my sister and spent a couple of weeks there in West Palm Beach. And then uh, she went off to Canada, and I slowly worked my way up from there. North Carolina, South Carolina, Alabama, North Carolina, South Carolina, Virginia, West Virginia, you know, um, Pennsylvania, and home. Um, anyway, I hope I've answered enough questions. I'll show you the map of my routes that I'm going to take this winter. And uh, if you, uh, you know, if you subscribe or ring the bell you get notifications every time I put a video up uh can't think of anything else if there's any questions just comment down below here's the map and uh see you in the next video